Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. My guest today is a man who is, in his capacity as a senior government official, responsible for two of the most controversial fields of public policy here in Germany and in many other countries too. That is migration and asylum. So let me introduce to you Manfred Schmidt. Thank you very, very much for coming uh, to Berlin today to be with us here on Talking Germany. Now, Manfred Schmidt is the head of Germany's Federal Office for Migration and Refugees, which is located in the Bavarian city of Nuremberg, and which is this year celebrating its 60th anniversary. So, Manfred Schmidt, I think the first question that I really want to ask you is, what does your agency do? Wir haben zwei wesentliche Aufgaben. Die eine Aufgabe ist, so sind we have wir two basic missions. The first is the one we were founded for 60 years ago, to deal with asylum issues. The men and women working at my agency look after everything to do with asylum in the Federal Republic of Germany. Our second function is to deal with all questions of integration. We organize what the German government offers to encourage integration. That ranges from conducting integration courses to financing immigration counselors to the over 300 projects which we run here in Germany. We're also in charge of welcoming and authenticating refugees. We've been intensively involved in the political debate on that issue in recent years and we must continue to take part in it in the years to come. Absolutely. Let me, let's get some facts and figures first. You mentioned refugees and asylum. How many people apply for asylum in Germany each year? In this year, we're expecting about 100,000 asylum applications. That's three times the number we received in 2008. So it's on the way up. Yes. 100,000 people. What percentage get it? Get the right to come and live in Germany? We have a we have a rate of about 30%. Every third person who seeks asylum from the Federal Republic of Germany receives protection here. They mainly come from the countries we see every day in the news. Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria. At the moment, Germany is taking in 5,000 Syrian refugees. What's taking place in our asylum operations mirrors what's going on in the world. We will talk about that very shortly, but as when, we, when you talk about a mirror of the world, Germany's got a population of 80, 82 million at the moment. I think I'm right with that figure. Uh, and you're, you're, you're involved with asylum, with refugees, but also with the whole question of migration. I think our viewers would like to know, it's an interesting question, what, what of those 82 million people, how many of them are people who are what people here in Germany, what people like you call migranten, people who are sort of first, second, third generation members of ethnic communities who have their origins way back when, elsewhere? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. How many, how many what, what number of people is that here in Germany? About 18% of the population of Germany have an immigration background, around 16 million people in the Federal Republic of Germany. Out of a population of 80 million, 16 million people have their roots in another country, or their families do. Okay. Nowadays, many of them were actually born here. Okay, so we've done some, we've, we've done some fact finding. You've given us some figures. I think our viewers would have been very interested to know how those figures, you know, what those figures are. Now, what I'd like to know from you is these issues: immigration, asylum, refugees. How important are they to Germany? How important are they to you personally? Because these are very contentious, very difficult issues. Um, it's a very, very central and important task for the country as a whole. We've already been changing for decades. Society has changed. I have also changed because I also live in this environment. 
dass sich auch verändert. The show is called to the Deutsch after all, typically German. Yeah, the English yeah. version of the show is Talking Germany. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and when, and when you talk about Germany, you have a certain image of Germany. And the reality of daily life is that when you walk around the cities, when you go to the market, this image has changed. And it's changed for me personally because I also live in this country. Mm -hmm. give me, give it, answer this question. It's the, the, that, that image of Germany, as it has changed in your life in the last 20 years, let's say, short answer, has it changed for the better or for the worse? Better. Yes, no doubt about it. Aye. We're going to have to talk about that. You've got your first impressions there from Manfred Schmidt. Uh, he is uh, more about the field that he works in. It's a place with a dark past, but a new future. Once, Nazi SS units were stationed here. Now it's the BAMF, Germany's Federal Office for Migration and Refugees. Manfred Schmidt has headed the BAMF, based in Nuremberg, since December 2010. It's an assignment that he's proud of. More than 2,000 of the agency's employees are active across the country. They help immigrants and asylum seekers start new lives in Germany. Schmidt is a 54-year-old attorney from Frankfurt. He began his career as a civil servant in the Federal Interior Ministry, first in Bonn, then in Berlin. When he was appointed president of the Office for Migration and Refugees, he moved to Nuremberg. Occasionally, Schmidt welcomes refugees personally at the airport, as here in July 2013, when 100 people from Iraq were admitted into Germany within the framework of a United Nations program. This year, the BAMF is celebrating its 60th anniversary. Its role has developed over the years. Since 2005, it has focused on promoting the integration of immigrants into German society. One of the agency's tasks is to certify textbooks for German language and integration courses. Schmidt has a hobby that he pursues ambitiously, even though right now he doesn't have much time for it. Photography. Many of his pictures date from his time in Berlin. father of two, he wants Germany to be a country where immigrants are welcome. And today he's our guest on Talking Germany, Manfred Schmidt. And my first question to Manfred Schmidt this time is, you're, in the report we learned there that you want Germany to be a more open and tolerant country towards immigrants, members of the immigrant community. What I don't understand is why Germany isn't that already. I think because we are... I believe that because for years, for decades, possibly we haven't discussed this topic properly, we were too late or we waited too long to define Germany as an immigration country. The members of the first guest worker generation which came here planned to return to their home countries, and we also thought they'd go back. Only after a long time, let's say about 10 or 12 years ago, did the discussion about Germany being an immigration country come to the fore. Of course, we've had immigration for centuries, but in political discourse, in our society's consciousness, this discussion has only surfaced during the past 12 years. It took a long time to get going, that debate, really, in Germany. Can I just interrupt you? What, what I find really interesting is that when you talk about this debate in Germany, what you're saying is you're using the German word wir, we, to talk about them. Has the moment arrived where the other people the people we're talking about have begun to be integrated into that debate. I'm not sure that it has in Germany. Not enough. Yeah. 
Wenn ich äh, rede von wir, dann meine ich When auch I say we, die, die I also mean those who grew up in Germany and live here. They're a part of our society. Die sind Teil unserer Gesellschaft. Mm. Also wenn ich wir so sage, when I say we, ich I don't just mean Germans Deutsch without immigrant roots, but all of us who were born and grew up here. Die hier geboren und aufgewachsen sind. Wenn ich heute My personal assistant comes from a Turkish family, but she's part of our group, my group. She was born here, grew up here, was educated here. She's a part of this Germany. She is us. When I use the word we, I don't mean one group or another group. Our duty is to achieve a consensus about this change in our society and define our perception of our Germany. Then everyone who's living here over the long term would feel they belong. It's interesting, you, um, you, 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 you wanted to be a policeman yes. when you were a young man. Why was that? As a boy, my dream was to become a policeman. But it didn't work out. You went and studied law, and you have become what we call here in Germany a Beamter. Can you explain for our international viewers what a Beamter is? A Beamter is a civil servant who has a special kind of loyalty to the state and its organizations. The biggest difference, maybe the simplest, is that I have no right to go on strike. As a Beamter, I'm not allowed to strike. Also, ich darf als Beamter nicht streiken. This was a creation of pr from Prussian times, as far as I'm informed. That the, the, in Prussian times, what they wanted was they wanted to have a highly qualified professional cast of people who would run the country well. And, the, and we needed people who had obligations, but also privileges, privileges. You've talked about the obligations, yeah? That you can't go on strike. The reason I'm asking you about being a Beamter, I talked to somebody recently who is one of the leading experts in Germany for all the issues surrounding migration. And what he told me was something very interesting. He said that at the lower level of the civil service, yeah, below the Beamten level that you're talking about, there are lots of people from the immigrant communities. At the higher level, Practically none. Is that the case in your agency? Because <clears throat> these are the important questions, aren't they? Well, um in my agency, 16% of the members have immigrant roots, and now the second and third generation of young people are university graduates. They've studied political science or law, and they're now reaching the upper levels at our agency and other government bodies. Our civil service is organized in a number of levels, and they're also in the highest, most senior echelon. Organisiert und die sind auch in der Stufe des höheren Dienstes, also der höchsten. Working their way up the system. Yeah. Okay. Reassuring. Uh, interesting. We we saw in the report that your your agency is housed in a building that used to be an SS barracks, an SS complex. A lot of people watching the show will think, how the heck does that go together? How does that work, that juxtaposition? Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could explain for yeah. us. The building was an SS barracks, and in 1941, concentration camp prisoners were housed there. Of course, that's an emotional issue for our agency. I think what's worked out, the philosophy of the building, is that what we do is diametrically opposed to the policies of the inhuman Nazi regime. In that very building, today we're discussing immigration issues. We're meeting with immigrant organizations, so exactly the opposite of what the building represented when it was built. Von dem, für das das Gebäude mal gebaut. It's an incredible development that they can actually feel comfortable in those in those walls. Mm -hmm. yeah. Und ich glaube, das ist die richtige Antwort. And I think that's the correct answer for the building.
Nuremberg, Nuremberg was part of that history with the Nuremberg laws and with the Nuremberg trials. Nuremberger Prozessen. Mm, very dark chapter of German yeah. history. Yeah. Und hier auch die Stadt yes, Nuremberg, der Oberbürgermeister. and the city of Nuremberg and its mayor have become actively engaged in that history, and we have become engaged for our part in the history of the former SS barracks. We are actually proud that we found the proper use for the building. Okay. We're talking about uh, immigration. Another aspect of the whole immigration debate that we've really only touched on is asylum. 100,000 applications we've heard for asylum are expected this year. What you find, of course, behind that number are tens of thousands of often desperate stories like this one uh, that takes us to Germany's northern coast. For 30-year-old Andreas, Hamburg means hope. He comes from Ghana and has a long journey behind him. Here in St. Pauli Church in the Hamburg district of the same name, he's hoping it will end well. After attending university back home, he went to Libya to earn money. But then came the war against the Gaddafi regime. Andreas fled in a boat to Italy. For two years, he lived in various camps there. Then he was given a tourist visa and told to leave. They came to me and they said, they are going to close down the, 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 the program. And so each and every one should take 400 euros to leave the program. The church is sheltering 80 refugees. In Italy, in addition to getting the 400 euros, they were advised to go to Germany, where there was more money. Their travel documents were valid across the EU. In Hamburg, they initially lived on the streets. In early June, Pastor Sieghard Wilm decided to offer them shelter in the church. <laughs> we can't just look on and watch people go to rack and ruin on the street. These are human beings and they have basic needs and human rights. Those are the issues that we have to address. If the politicians close their eyes, we have to open ours. That's how it is. Wilm founded the Embassy of Hope on the church grounds. Since then, there's been a standoff between the church with its charity and Hamburg's government, which points out that EU treaties say someone who makes landfall in Italy can only apply for asylum there. The men from Africa who come to us via Italy have tourist visas that are valid for about three months. They can't get a valid residence permit after that, so they have to go back. The refugees have gone public. They've written that they haven't survived NATO's war in Libya just to die on the streets of Hamburg. Their message? The West shares responsibility for their fate. If we are here, we are not here Europe by mistake. You know, we are here because of something who happened. And they have to open their eye and know that, yeah, even their country is preaching the good democracy for others and good ruling and human rights, but they are countries to have to do it, not only preach. Some neighborhood residents are providing practical aid. They do the refugees' laundry, bring along food, and donate money. For me, it's about the here and now, and the help that's simply needed on site. Not about fighting a battle, but making our neighborhood work. And I think that's possible here. Nearly six weeks now. The refugees from Libya know that their chances of being allowed to stay are slim, but they're still hoping they'll be able to. And more and more people have the same aim. In the past year, the number of asylum seekers in Germany has almost doubled. So Manfred Schmidt, we were looking there at the story of uh, Andreas from, from, from West Africa who came across the Mediterranean to Europe. He made it to Europe. He's very typical for the people we do. You mentioned this, we see on our evening news programs. It's a terrible journey and many people perish along the way. What sort of emotions do you have about that? What does it mean for you personally and what sort of lessons do you learn from that? When you listen to the refugee stories, they're often moving. Also, my decision makers who hold hearings with asylum seekers, who speak with them about their stories, about their credibility, are often moved. Sache. Auf der anderen Seite 
sind europäisch. On the other hand, we have to uphold European and German laws. Und da ist man ab und zu mal in so einem, so einem Zwiespalt. Sometimes we're caught up in a dilemma, a conflict with what we're trained to do as a federal agency. Den, den man aushalten muss und für den wir auch im Bundesamt ausgebildet sind. What do you mean with that? When you, when you say you've got to learn to live with the, con with the contradiction and, and, and you, you're trained to learn to live with the contradiction, what does that mean in concrete terms? Because it's, it's tough. It's tough saying no to those people. Ja. Yeah. Yes. Auf der anderen Seite kommen auch Every third person who seeks protection from the Federal Republic of Germany receives asylum. But people also come not for the reasons defined in the Geneva Convention, but who've left their country because they feel they've got no economic future there and they want to start a new life here. They're not covered by the Geneva Convention. Sie sind aber außerhalb der Genfer Flüchtlingskonvention. Their reasons are often plausible, but even so, we have to say no. Trotzdem müssen wir sagen, nein. Dieses Verfahren. The process that my agency is responsible for is not the same as the one for immigrating to Germany to seek employment. Marktzuwanderung in die Bundesrepublik Deutschland. It's interesting because Germany's constitution says uh, that people. Uh, persecuted on political grounds enjoy a right to asylum. And the reason why that was written into the German constitution, the reason why it's so important in Germany is because so many people during the Nazi period were taken in by other countries. Yeah. Is Germany repaying the debt that it has to the world still? And is it repaying it fully and properly? Der Artikel 16 is in der Tat... Um Article 16 is in fact a consequence of Germany's history. Actually, Article 16 plays a secondary role in our current daily work. Today, there are other grounds for refugees aside from those defined in Article 16. If you look at the civil war in Syria, asylum is covered by the Geneva Refugee Convention, but it's not political persecution in the narrow classical sense. I think what we're doing is part of Germany's obligation to behave and act humanely. And that has nothing to do with repaying that debt. Zu, äh, zu verhalten und zu bewegen. Das hat aber, glaube ich, nichts mit, mit Rückzahlen zu tun. When you say humanitarian, yeah, we've got a. Um, let's listen to an Iranian woman, yeah, now. Her name is uh, Neda Soltani, who applied for and got asylum here in Germany. It's very interesting to hear what she has to say about what she went through. Uh, and I'd like to invite you to have a close listen to this and then perhaps to comment on what she has to say. Let's listen to what uh, her. I was her thankful was. for the security that the German state had provided me with because I was really in need of a safe state, and that was what German authorities have provided me with. So I, I was and I am, and I will forever be very thankful for that and for all the opportunities. But the period of time that I spent at the refugee camp, I think will forever remain as a dark spot in just my memory of all these years. Because as a refugee, you arrive in a traumatized state and then the refugee camp just doubles or triples your traumas. A traumatized person being traumatized still further. That can't be good. It can't be right. Um. Of course, it's a difficult situation for everyone involved. It's difficult for the refugees who have fled from a terrible situation. And of course, it's also difficult for us as a German agency, which has to rule on who receives asylum. Of course, how to decide, when to decide, is also the problem which is controversial in Germany. The issue of how to accommodate the refugees. Von, von Flüchtlingen. Ähm, aber nochmal, wir haben Once again, 30% are accepted and 70% are rejected. And those 70% are frequently deported. 
This year we're expecting 100,000 applications for asylum. That's the largest number in Europe. Top eins in Europa. Yeah. But a lot of people who are watching this programme, they will have heard about Germany being an ageing country, a country that is facing major demographic challenges, that needs hungry, healthy, uh, aspirational young people in the country. And we're talking about, in the main, keeping people out. Um, weil wir, uh, weil wir dass wir because we have to make sure we don't mix the different groups together. We have a demographic problem, an ageing society. If I remember correctly, we're the second oldest country after Japan. It doesn't look good. Japan. Yeah. But asylum and the Geneva Refugee Convention is not the same issue as controlled immigration for the labour market. That's another group. A net balance of 320,000 people in 2012 came to Germany to work and live. My asylum procedures are for people who come here needing protection on the grounds of individual persecution. Das Asylsystem ist kein System der Zuwanderung in die Bundesrepublik Deutschland. Asylum and immigration are two different things which we should keep separate at the outset of the discussion. Asyl und Zuwanderung sind sind zwei unterschiedliche unterschiedliche Punkte, die wir da einfach in der Diskussion auch auseinanderhalten müssen. I can understand that the people you uh, that you have a tough job that the people who work for you have a tough job in very many instances. But I'd really like to know: Do you sometimes have you know, sleepless nights because of the nature of the choices that your organization, that your agency has to make? Um, also schlaflose Nächte, um I wouldn't say I have sleepless nights. Many problems facing us are resolvable. Our staff have to solve them within the framework of our administration. After 25 years of public service, you have fewer sleepless nights anyway. But sometimes we do have sleepless nights when we're made aware of an individual case. That motivates us to find a reasonable solution which still fits into the overall system. Okay. Now, since uh, 2005, many people who receive a residency permit here in Germany are obliged to take what is called an integration course. It's made up of two parts, language teaching and an orientation course. Now, the, uh, the programme has been criticised by some and welcomed by others. All the best to Ismail. It's a great story there. Um, this, these intro, in, integration courses were introduced in 2005. Just explain precisely why. Um, because until then we didn't have any comprehensive standardised programme. How German was taught was a bit arbitrary. Wie deutsche Sprache vermittelt wird. Und mm -hmm. wir hatten das Gefühl, we had the feeling that we had to organize it differently, both for those who had been living in Germany for a while, as well as for new arrivals. Dass wir das anders organisieren müssen. Mm -hmm. Ich glaube, dass Integration, I believe that integration measures shouldn't be left entirely to chance, and that we need a program for it. Werden sollten. Mm -hmm. We're famous for our integration course, which has been well received. Over a million have been eligible and 900,000 participants took part. More than half took the course voluntarily in order to learn German. Everyone knows that Germany has one big disadvantage, the German language. Because it's not a global language. Yes, it's relatively complicated. Interesting, though, that Germany, I feel, in the last couple of years is becoming a little bit more of a global language than it previously was. That's an interesting de development. Who has to take the course? Does everybody have to take the course who comes to live? in Germany? 
We have different groups. New immigrants who come to Germany attend the integration course. But what about people who, are, who have close ties to Germany already and know German culture and possibly know the German language? Surely they don't have to do the course and pass a test. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, some are compelled to take the course. There are also participants, a very small number, who are sent by the Foreigners' Registration Office, and some are sent by the Federal Employment Agency in order to make it easier for them to enter the labor market. All over the world, integration is difficult if you don't speak the language. But the integration course is only one aspect. We do a lot more in the integration area. We have over 350 projects here in Germany. It's exemplary. We take part in the sociological discussion on the culture of welcoming and acceptance. We have immigration counselors who help the people arriving here adjust to our system, which is new to them. Yeah. All good things too. Uh, I suppose one, one interesting question, because again we're talking a little bit about sort of we are talking about them and what can be offered to them. Integration is, is a two-way street. Yeah? Do, you know, German residents of Germany also have to learn integration? Surely there should be integration courses at German schools, for example. We've already had the debate over whether the integration courses are comprehensive enough. That's an interesting word. Yeah. No, integration is not a one-way street. It's a prerequisite of integration that the society at large, all of us, have to take it seriously and not pay any mind to a person's surname, but quite honestly focus on their abilities, what they can contribute, what their role is. That's what everybody has to learn, what society at large has to learn. People like you and me, yeah? I'm sure we have a lot to learn. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've also learned very much in the last three years. Yeah. Okay. We've talked a lot about uh, integration, immigration, asylum, refugee. Let's change the subject now. We're going to talk about something that is quite close to Manfred Schmidt's heart because uh, in many parts of the world, commuting is part of everyday life. Uh, Germany, as I'm sure you can imagine, is no exception. Uh, we have this report on the daily grind. <laughs> You live in Nuremberg. Yeah. How far away from your office do you live? It's about 20 minutes by car, about 9 kilometres. Nine kilometer. Okay, 20, 20 minutes. Uh, is somebody who drives 20 minutes to work and 20 minutes back, is the, uh, are you a commuter? No. No, you're not a commuter. Yeah. Am I a commuter here in Berlin? I, 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 go, I need half an hour to get from home to work by bike. Commuter? Nein. No. No? How long do you have to be in the transport before you are a commu commuter? Um, it's hard to say. I don't think there is any definition. Maybe more than 10 kilometers? <laughs> You're a very technically minded person. You're thinking, yeah, what's the official definition of the commuter? No. I, I thought about that as well. I thought I'll look, in the, I'll look to see you know, how it is defined. I don't know. The reason we're talking about all this is not because you are a commuter, but because your wife is yeah? a different kind of commuter. A sort of a, a long-distance commuter. Tell us what the story is. When I accepted the position in Nuremberg, we asked ourselves how we would organize our lives. Our two children are 24 and 25. They're out of the house and have their own apartments. My wife works here in Berlin. As president of the agency in Nuremberg, I have to have my primary residence there. And because I have quite a few appointments outside of Nuremberg, many of them in the evening, we decided that my wife would keep her job in Berlin and commute on the weekends. So you have a, a long-distance relationship. 
Ja. ja. <laughs> well, how, how far is it from Berlin to Nuremberg? You need to explain for the viewers. It's 450 kilometers. It takes her about four hours in the car. She drives? No. Okay. You need about five hours on the train. She flies. That takes 45 minutes. Okay. And how does she use her time while she is being a, com uh, a commuter? What does she do? So it's interesting in the report that we just heard, there are some people who sort of, you know, dream about a better life and other people who use their time, you know, for, I don't know what, study purposes or whatever. What does your wife do? She's head of the demographics department in the Federal Interior Ministry. So we have both a professional and private connection because immigration and demographics are associated. And we both work for the Interior Ministry. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And, uh, and one question, as somebody who has been a sort of a, uh, in a long-distance relationship for all this time, in a commuting relationship, what tips do you have for people who are involved in the same situation? You have to organize your life when you're at the other location, so you really do have free time for each other. The weekend relationship is more concentrated than if you were together on a daily basis. Um, miteinander umgeht als um, das tagtägliche zusammen. Words of wisdom from Manfred Schmidt. He's been a good guest here on Talking Germany. He's the, uh, uh, the head of Germany's Office for Migration and Refugees. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, come back next week. Tschüss. <laughs>